Hey, God bless you, TG Nation, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, wherever you're watching us. We just want to say thank you for tuning in. Listen, we got an amazing worship service today. But before we get into worship, we want to give you an opportunity to sow into the kingdom. Listen, if you're out there struggling and you're having a hard time making ends meet, then I'm not talking to you. As a matter of fact, we're looking to be a blessing to you. But for my people out there, you got 99 problems, but money ain't one and you feel the Holy Spirit leading you to sow into the kingdom, we invite you to help us be a blessing to others. So we're going to give you several ways to give. They'll be right on the screen. You can text to give. You can cash app us. Uh, you can even go online and give through our website. Any of those methods. Even for our church family, you can mail your tithes into the church. We just want to give you an opportunity to sow. Amen. So while you're doing that, we want to get some music playing, give you some giving music. So we want to go ahead and get that started. Come on, everybody, go ahead and get something and prepare to be a blessing. Man, listen, is there anybody's testimony out there? I will bless the Lord. Amen. Listen, you know if you're a part of TG Family what we're about to do. If you're watching us from abroad, come on, we want to throw up a prayer. Just say it with us on three. Everybody who knows the prayer, one, two, three. In Jesus' name, I sow the seed. By faith, I cancel all lack and need. I declare with power the victory for my good and for God's glory. Amen. Come on again. We thank you for whatever you gave. Whatever you gave allows us to be a blessing to the community. God is pleased. We love you. God bless you. God bless your Total Grace family, YouTube Live, Facebook Live. Thank you guys for joining us yet another Sunday for our watch party, our worship watch party. You could be watching any pastor, any service across the country. So we're so glad that you've tuned in for us. I can promise you that there's going to be a powerful word today that will inspire you and motivate you uh, and encourage you in this season of unrest that we're in right now. Uh, listen, do me a favor real quick. Let us know where you're watching from, wherever you're watching from. Uh, go ahead and let us know. Maybe you're right here in Lexington watching from your couch, your living room, your kitchen, wherever. Let us know where you're watching from, man. And listen, I want you to be engaged. Talk back to us. Throw up some praying hands. Hit some hearts. Say, preach, Pastor Mike. Let's be uh, engaged and worship together. Amen. Uh, listen, we're going to deal uh, with a very important message today. So I need you to be open-minded right? Be open-minded and hear what it is that I have to say because I'm really teaching from my heart today, teaching from my heart today. So listen, before we jump into the thrust of what we're going to be talking about, could, could we pray? Do me a favor. Just stretch your hand towards the screen. You know the prayer if you're a Total Grace family member. If not, uh, just stay with us. Come on, hold your hand towards the screen. Let's pray. Precious Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We come to you the sacred hour that our lives might be changed. We thank you for your total grace that keeps us day by day. And Lord, all we ask of you is that you simply have your way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, listen, today as our scriptural thrust, we'll be using Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. Uh, I'm not going to really be teaching scripturally, solely. I want to speak to you today thematically, but kind of as our platform, we'll use Joshua 6, 
chapter six, I mean chapter six, verses six and seven. We get it on the screen. Uh, but in a nutshell, this is where God is giving Joshua instructions about how he is to take them into the Jericho city, right? Y'all know the story. Jericho is surrounded by a huge wall, an impenetrable wall, but God is going to lead his people into that wall. And Joshua is getting the instructions. He tells Joshua, get the people together, get the priest, take up the Ark of the Covenant, and I want y'all to march. Wait a minute. Yeah, I want y'all to march around the city and through the marching and the obedience of God's people, he's going to use them. Watch this to bring down those walls, but we'll get back to that later. Listen again, not simply scriptural today, but I want to speak to you thematically, thematically, and to highlight a couple of biblical themes. I want to use three books, three books, three works uh, of one of my academic mentors, uh, the late Dr. James Cone, the late Dr. James Cone. These books, I'll write them down. First, Black Liberation Theology. Black Liberation Theology. That's number one. Number two, number two is God of the Oppressed. God of the Oppressed. And the third book is The Cross and the Lynching Tree. If you've never read those, that's something you definitely got to read before you go to heaven. Listen to me. Before you leave this planet, you need to get the information in those books in your brain. I promise you, they're, they are life-changing. Black Liberation Theology, God of the Oppressed, and The Cross and the Lynching Tree. So come on, I want I don't want to keep it long today, but let's get right into it. Again, speaking thematically, the first theme we're going to use, Black Liberation Theology. Black Liberation Theology. So, so write this down. Here's the first point I want you to write down. Liberation is a biblical theme. Write it down. Liberation is a biblical theme. Oh, okay. Where is this coming from? In light of the recent release of a statement by one of the large, major white evangelical churches in our city, uh, a very well-intentioned statement, a very well-intentioned statement. However, the statement, uh, I mean, loudly highlighted a diverging place between uh, white evangelicals and the black church. Uh, it is really really been a historical conflict and it is about how is the church to respond to social justice. On one hand, you have many white evangelical churches who believe that the role of the church is to teach the gospel of Christ, to teach the gospel of Christ and remain silent or stay away from socio-cultural issues. He hear me, teach the gospel, teach about Jesus, teach about the love of God, but stay away from socio-cultural issues within our society. That is quite different from the other train of thought, which is that we as a church are to teach the gospel. However, the gospel is inclusive of sociocultural issues, that the gospel itself engages culture. Jesus himself engages culture and is an opponent against injustices. So again, those are the two things, are the two, to do the two ideologies. Y'all stay with me. I'm trying to do some good teaching today. So on one hand, you believe that the church is to stay away from social justice. On the other hand, the church, it should be involved in social justice. So again, we find the statement being released, which just highlights that, highlights that historical issue. And what I want to show you today is, is that I believe, I believe that as we look at these themes, you will be able to form your own opinion about what the responsibility of the church is. Okay, so back to the teaching. The first point was, was, is that liberation is a biblical theme. It is a biblical theme. So, so why is it that I say that? P pay close attention. Uh, we were in Joshua, but before we get to Joshua, the leadership of the Israelite people were in the hands of Moses. The, the story of Moses goes all the way back to the initial engaging of God with his people. The initial call narrative of God calling the Israelites to himself to be his people. We find the context of that story uh, with the Israelites being in a state of oppression. They are in e under Egyptian captivity. They are being mistreated. They are being discriminated against. They are in slavery. They are being forced to work all as a systematic scheme or manipulation to keep them from rising up, to keep them from becoming all that God wants them to be. They are trapped in the system of oppression. And what we find is, is that in this place of oppression, God hears their cries. Come on. The context of the very genesis of God calling his people, he hears their cries from a state of oppression. And God then 
puts in motion a plan, watch this, to liberate them. Yes, the very genesis of the relationship between God and his people is a relationship of liberation. Liberation is a biblical theme. God uses, watch now, watch this plan to set Moses as a prophetic voice, a prophetic voice, a voice that speaks truth to power. The powerful is the Egyptian government. The powerful is Pharaoh. And God takes Moses and gives Moses spirit-filled power, gives him a prophetic voice so that he is to go speak truth to power. He goes to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, God told me to tell you that it's time for you to let my people go. Here it is again. It's time for you to liberate his people. And then watch this. God sends Moses to be a prophetic voice, but he sends Moses on his behalf. Moses says, what am I to tell them when they ask me who sent me? God says, tell them I am sent you. You're not going in your own power. You're not going in your own name. You're going in my name. Why? Because liberation is a biblical theme. God sends Moses to liberate his people and he has uh, this head-to-head -head conflict with the Egyptian government, with Pharaoh. So you have the power of the people against the Egyptian government and God is in the midst of them and he finds, watch, that God begins to send plagues. He begins to fight on behalf of the Israelite people in order to liberate them. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? Liberation is a biblical theme. Oh, okay, wait a minute. You need this to make sense for you? Even when God found you, even when God found me, can I talk to somebody that's watching right now? When God found you, you were in a state of oppression. You were in bondage to sin. You were a slave to sin. And God came to liberate you, to snatch you out of the devil's bondage so that you're no longer his slave, but now you are liberated. You are delivered. God set you free. God is a liberating God. He liberated the Egyptian, I mean the Israelites from Egyptian captivity. He, he liberated you from the captivity of the devil over your life. You are no longer a slave to him because you've been liberated. Somebody out there ought to throw up your hands and thank God for being a liberating God. When he found you in the mess you were in, he liberated you. When you were in the stuck in a state of uh, of constant sin, trapped in that lifestyle. God liberated you. He is a liberating God. Did y'all write that first thing down? Did you, did you write it down? Liberation is a biblical theme. It is undeniable. You cannot read the Bible and ignore the, the theme of liberation all throughout the biblical text. And, and watch this, when it comes to social justice, the Bible speaks to justice over a hundred times. It is a clear narrative that God is an opponent of those who are uh facing injustices, uh, an opponent of those who are discriminating or those who are conducting injustices. It speaks to justice so many times within the biblical text. So again, we find this theme throughout the entire Bible. Write it down. I don't know if you wrote it down. Liberation is a biblical theme. God coming to liberate his people. God coming to liberate those who are captives. God coming to liberate those uh, who are in oppression. Okay, that leads me to the next theme and the next book. The next theme and the next book. Again, my Dr. James Cone, God the God of the oppressed, God of the oppressed. Write that down, get that book, however you can get it. Here's the next thing. So first, we see that liberation is a biblical theme. Number two, write this down. Write, write this down. God is on the side of the oppressed. Okay, I'm gonna stand strong here because there are people who would like to uh, disprove or discredit this biblical truth that in my opinion is undeniable. God is on the side of the oppressed. Did you get that down? Okay, let me do some good teaching. Somebody say, preach Pastor Mike. Uh, all right, watch this. The reason we know that God is on the side of the oppressed is because we see it all throughout scripture. The reason we don't like to, to, to say that is because sometimes it's difficult for us to believe that God is for somebody and against somebody else. That God is for somebody and against somebody else. We like to paint God as this magical middleman that sits in between and never judges or never makes a decision to lean in the direction of, of one person or the other. But, but really, that's not what we see in the biblical context. Uh, following the thoughts of Dr. James Cone, here's, here's what a question that you often hear, or at least a scenario that's painted about God. 
God uh, being this magical middleman. Imagine this. We're in the middle passage and, and we're on slave ships, right? That they've just left Africa uh, and they have crowded slaves on the bottom of a slave ship like cargo stacked one on top of each other right right that, that that's what we that's the scenario that we're in we're traveling during the middle passage on our way back to the west and on the top half of the ship you have the slavers who went into this country manipulated the people and have stolen people to bring them back to be slaves they're on the top of the ship praying to god god thank you for allowing us to be successful in gathering these people to be our slaves. God bless us as we take this voyage back to America so that these people can work for us and build our country, right? They're praying to God to bless their oppressing, oppression. And then on the bottom of the ship, the very same ship, you have the slaves who are praying to a God. God, uh, save us uh, from these slavers, liberate us from this captivity. Uh, God, bless us. And, and here's the question. Are these two people praying to the same God? Is the God that would be willing to bless the slave owners be the same God that blesses the slaves? I, I, I'm just asking you to think through the question. It is often stated that they are not, it's not the same God. They're not praying to the same God because God is not this magical middle man who, who sits in the middle and blesses the slaves and blesses the slave owners, who blesses the oppressed and at the same time blesses the oppressors that sits in the middle and blesses the evil, but also blesses the good, that blesses the saints, but also blesses the sinner, that God never takes side, that God doesn't judge. That God is the figment of your imagination. But the God I serve even tells us he would rather us not be lukewarm. He don't want us to be in the middle. You be hot or you be cold, because if you're lukewarm, I see some Bible readers out there. God says, I will spew you out of my mouth. If God expects us to not rest in the middle, but to have a side that if God tells us to not be lukewarm, then why would God be a lukewarm leader? God is not a leader. God judges the entire Deuteronomy narrative uh, where the prophets are speaking about the Hebrew culture, the Hebraic culture of blessings and cursings. The whole chapter almost, the whole context is about the fact that God blesses some things and he curses other things. Come with me. Dr. Jeremiah Wright uh, became infamous because of a sermon where he said, we say God bless America, but really God damn America. Y'all know that when President Obama uh, was running to be president, uh, his his pastor was put on the forefront because he made statements like that. But literally, Dr. Jeremiah Wright was teaching that there are things in America that God is not blessing. God is not blessing slavery. God is not blessing police brutality. God is not uh, blessing the discrepancies and the disparities that we see in the healthcare system. God is not blessing the racism uh, and the bigotry that we see in this country. God blesses uh, those things that are blessed worthy and he curses those things that are curse worthy. Stay with me. I'm trying to make this make sense to you. God is on the side of the oppressed. Why y'all looking at me funny? Let's, let's stay in the Bible. God meets the Israelites. He calls them to be his people. So he is with his people. Uh, first, can we talk Bible first under Egyptian oppression? God is with them. Uh, then under Assyrian oppression, God is with them. Then under Babylonian oppression, God is with them. Then under Persian oppression, God is with them. Then under Greek oppression, God is with them. Then under Roman oppression, God is with them. And could I suggest to you under the Western American oppression, God is with the oppressed that even through civil rights and even to this very day that God is on the side of the oppressed. God fights on the side of the oppressed and the 
only people that would deny that biblical truth are those who look at the text through the lens of an oppressor. If you are an oppressor, it would be hard for you to acknowledge the fact that God fights on the side of the oppressed. Somebody say amen. I'm so glad that I serve a God who is on my side, a God who fights for justice, a God that stands up for righteousness. When I look over my life and all the things that I've been through, I got to give God praise because whenever I was in a state of oppression, he became my liberator. Y'all don't see what I'm trying to say to you. When friends turned their back on me, God was on my side. When I was done wrong on jobs, God was on my side. When somebody treated me uh, harshly or tried to oppress me, God was on my side. And the fact of the matter is that you can look back over your life and say the same thing. God has been your opponent. He has been your proponent. He has been on your side. And for that reason, you ought to give him praise. Okay, are y'all still with me? God, uh, he wants us to see this, this biblical, these biblical themes. One, we know that liberation is, liberation is a biblical theme and it's undeniable. We see that God is on the side of the oppressed. God was against the, the Egyptians. God was against the Assyrians. God was against the Persians. God were against the Babylonians. Y'all better do me a favor and pay attention to what I'm trying to say to you. You serve a God who fights on behalf of those who are oppressed. Even Jesus says that he comes to preach the gospel to the poor, right? He comes on side, on the side of the oppressed. Oh, okay, that gets me to this, to this next uh, book that I want to use to prop up the theme, God is on the side of the oppressed. It is the Dr. James Cone, another work by his entitled The Cross and the Lynching Tree. This is possibly one of my, my favorite works ever written, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. Within this, uh, within this text, it talks about the truth of the harshness of slavery. It, it basically suggests, watch this, that you cannot see, you cannot view uh, the cross. How do I want to say this? You cannot view the cross, yet be blinded of its similarities with the lynching tree. Okay, y'all looking at me funny. Let me make this make sense. He compares the fact that as Jesus was hung on the cross, as Jesus was hung on a tree, that you cannot ignore the resemblance to the black men and women who were hung from trees. Okay, here's the idea. Crucifixion is a governmental system designed to impose fear on criminals to prevent them from engaging in criminal activities. It is meant to be harsh. It is meant to be brutal. It is meant to make people afraid of suffering the same fate. Nails in their hands, nails in their feet, hanging on the cross, barely being able to breathe, excruciating pain flowing through their body. Nobody wants to do anything wrong and suffer that fate. Same way, the same way lynching, lynching was a systematic plan to instill fear in slaves so that they would not rise up against their oppressors, right? They hung them from trees. It was meant to be brutal. It was meant to make them suffer, suffocating. Uh, hanging from a cross. This is, this is brutal. And it was done so to strike fear, to prevent them from rising up. So could I do something? What I say America is always guilty of, we, we stand in the Bible, y'all don't, don't stray from me. What America is guilty of is doing a tremendous job of whitewashing history at making history PG. Because I believe that if people were really taught the real things that took place uh, in our history, that they would be more prone to be sympathetic and empathetic of the plight of black people in this country. For instance, for instance, as we're talking about the lynching tree, remember as people gathered around the cross to watch Jesus be crucified, that that's the same type of scenario you see with lynchings. Lynchings were such a part of culture. Watch this even white evangelical culture, lynchings were such a part of it that they would dismiss school early. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. So that the kids 
could come be with their families, that they could gather in the town squares to watch the lynching of a black man, right? They were celebrated. I could get into many more gruesome acts that were done that many people have never heard of. This is the history of our country. This is what has developed and evolved into what we have today. So let, let's not, let's not uh, act like we are completely oblivious or ignorant to the history of our country. So we see this act of oppression, but can I give God praise? The devil thought he thought that this crucifixion was going to strike fear in people, that it was going to prevent those who follow Christ from continuing to speak up because who wanted to be crucified? That, that's what the devil thought, right? But here's what happened when, they, when Christ allowed himself to be hung on the cross and died. In his death, he conquered the grave and was resurrected. So his death manifested into life. They thought it was going to be death, but his death became life. I'm trying to teach. I need y'all to stay with me and now his name carries power because his name it even conquered death he thought the enemy thought that death was going to be intimidation but it was really motivation because his life that came after the death it motivated the disciples to stand up and to preach the gospel with Holy Ghost power that erected the church and began a movement a movement that was on the back of Jesus his death. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. And today, I think the enemy thought that his intimidation tactics were going to keep people from rising up. But instead of keeping people from rising up, what they thought was going to be intimidation was really motivation. They thought that a knee to the neck was going to be intimidation. They thought that uh, killing a young lady in her own house with a no-knock warrant was going to be intimidation. They thought choking Brother Garner out was going to be intimidation. The death of Trayvon, they thought it was going to be intimidation. But God has a way of using what the enemy thought would be intimidation to use it for motivation. Now what I know Notice, watch this, y'all don't hear what I'm saying, is that when we're protesting, the protesters will often chat, say their names, say Trayvon Martin, say George Floyd, say Breonna Taylor, say their names. Why? Because now their names serve not as intimidation, but as motivation. Because in their death, their death has manifested into the life of a generation of people that want to see change. I wish I had enough time to deal with this the way I want to. So come back here. Here we go, Joshua. Joshua is at the Jericho Wall. God is telling Joshua to march, march, march every day, march for seven days, march even when you don't see a change, march even when they looking down on you from the wall thinking that you're foolish, march even when people saying this marching is getting old, we've been marching for days and ain't nothing happened. I want to talk to my culture today, march even though it looked like nothing is changing, keep marching even though people are telling you that it's obstructive and and that you shouldn't do it. Keep marching. God says keep marching and on the seventh day march seven times and let out a shout. Here's what I'm trying to suggest to you. Jericho was behind a wall, right? Only certain people were allowed to be in Jericho. This wall uh, kept certain people out and certain people in. We in America today see the same type of wall. Those who have are inside of the wall. Those who have not are on the outside of the wall. Those with power are on the inside of the wall. Those who are powerless are on the outside of the wall. Those who are being oppressed are on the outside of the wall. The oppressors are on the inside of the wall. I wish I had enough time to deal with this the way I'm suggesting. And we are in the street marching. And what I want to suggest to you is that the same God that's been a liberator all throughout scripture is a God that will be a liberator today. This is a Moses movement, but it's with the Joshua generation. And they're going to keep marching. They're going to keep shouting. Watch this until the wall comes comes down. The wall of injustice, the wall of discrimination, the wall of hatred is going to come down so that we can see justice begin to flow, that we can begin to see people love each other on all uh, on one accord, all races, all ethnicities, all gender, because God is on the side of the oppressed. And what I suggest to you is that we will see change in the season if we keep marching. Listen, I don't want to keep y'all too long. I'm done. I hope this is a blessing to somebody. Remember that liberation, it is a biblical theme. That liberating God's people, he uses us. He uses the church. He uses people, the people of God, the church to be uh, 
uh, to be proponents of liberation, to keep fighting against injustice, to keep fighting against racism and bigotry, to keep fighting so that people are equal, people are treated the same and fairly. Remember, he is on the side of the oppressed. I'm so glad that we serve a God who is with us. And above everything else, I want you to remember that in the struggle, we're not meant to be divided in the struggle. We're not meant to exude hate in the struggle. We are to allow the love of God to be what brings down the wall. Our marching, our shouting, but done so in obedience to the will of God. And we'll see a change come. Listen, I want y'all to remember this. I love you. God bless you. Hey, God bless you guys again. Man, such an amazing word. Did that bless anybody out there? Come on, I see you guys watching from all over the place. North Carolina, I see you in the house. NYC in the house. Listen, after such an amazing word, we want to make sure that we give you an opportunity to get your life connected with Christ. The most important part of service is the part where you have to make a decision. Is your life where it needs to be? If it's not, don't worry. There's nothing you've done that's so great that God's grace can't cover it. His grace is sufficient. So we want to give you an opportunity. Put your life in his hands. If you don't know that you're saved, if you don't know that heaven is going to be your eternal home, the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God and that he was raised from the dead, you shall be saved. So we want to give you an opportunity to make sure that you have the blessed assurance of salvation. If you feel the Holy Spirit moving over your heart, all you got to do is text us the number on the screen and we'll make sure somebody contacts you or inbox us on this page and we'll make sure that you get connected with somebody that will walk you through the plan of salvation. Listen. There's no reason that this broadcast should end and you not know for sure that your life is securely wrapped in the hands of our master. Come on all over the place. Take that time. Think to yourself. Have you made that decision? Come on. This is your moment. Don't hesitate. Don't wait. This is your moment. Your season. Your breakthrough is so close. Just inbox us. Text us. Come on. Come on. Come on. Listen, again, thank you guys so much. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We want to make sure that as we come to an end of our service today, that we go to God in prayer, thanking him for each and every one of you who made a decision to give your life to Christ or even just to unite with total grace. Maybe you just text us because you need prayer. Whatever the reason is, we're grateful for you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for an amazing service right in the comfort of our own homes. We thank you for your protection through the pandemic. God, we just thank you for being an awesome and amazing God. God, I thank you for every life that you brought to you through Total Grace this week. And whatever church that they people were watching all over the globe today, God, we just pray that there was a mighty move all over the world. We're believing you for a mighty revival. God, we thank you for them. We thank you for this day. God, we ask that you would stay with us, lead us, and guide us as we leave this place, but never your presence. We love you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Come on, everybody, say amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. We love you. Hey, God bless you, TG Nation, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, wherever you're watching us. We just want to say thank you for tuning in. Listen, we got an amazing worship service today, but before we get into worship, we want to give you an opportunity to sow into the kingdom. Listen, if you're out there struggling and you're having a hard time making ends meet, then I'm not talking to you. As a matter of fact, we're looking to be a blessing to you. But for my people out there, you got 99 problems, but money ain't one. And you feel the Holy Spirit leading you to sow into the kingdom, we invite you to help us be a blessing to others. So we're going to give you several ways to give. They'll be right on the screen. You can text to give. You can cash app us. Uh, you can even go online and give through our website. Any of those methods. Even for our church family, you can mail your tithes into the church. We just want to give you an opportunity to sow. Amen. So while you're doing that, we want to get some music playing, give you some giving music. So we want to go ahead and get that started. Come on, everybody, go ahead and get something and prepare to be a blessing.
Hey Amen. Listen, is there anybody's testimony out there? I will bless the Lord. Amen. Listen, you know if you're a part of TG Family what we're about to do. If you're watching us from abroad, come on, we want to throw up a prayer. Just say it with us on three. Everybody who knows the prayer, one, two, three. In Jesus' name, I sow the seed. By faith, I cancel all lack and need. I declare with power the victory for my good and for God's glory. Amen. Come on again. We thank you for whatever you gave. Whatever you gave allows us to be a blessing to the community. God is pleased. We love you. God bless you.